Chamber Talk Radio. Solid news, solid advice, and solid solutions for chambers of commerce throughout the United States. Chamber Talk Radio is working with professionals and consultants from coast to coast to bring you valuable information and a unique perspective on how you can successfully build and manage your chamber. If you would like to become part of the Chamber Talk Radio Club, please visit www.chambertalkradio.com and click the Join the Club button right at the top. This broadcast is brought to you by the Chamber Industry, our hosts, and our show sponsors. Now, let's get started. Welcome to Chamber Talk Radio. Chamber Talk Radio is brought to you by Chamber Nation and MembershipSalesSystem.com. My name is Sam Azam. I will be your host for today's show. Just about every chamber does some kind of networking program for its members. Uh, today we will take a look at some ways to get more out of your networking program uh, with better networking facilitated by chambers. Our guest for today's show is Kevin Holsapple. Kevin is a principal of Highline Associates LLC, a consulting business that works in the realms of organizations, economic, community business, and tourism development. Their clientele is a mix of businesses and nonprofit organizations seeking to improve performance. Kevin's experience includes 17 years as Chamber Executive Director, Main Street Organization President, and CEO of an Economic Development Corporation and Meeting and Visitors Bureau. Kevin is also the former president and officer of the New Mexico Chamber Executive Association, and he's here to tell us uh, a very unique way and some thoughts that he has on networking. So welcome, Kevin, to Chamber Talk Radio, and we'll just start out by asking you to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and and then we'll get into the program. Well, glad to be here, Sam. Thanks for inviting me. Um, You know, as you mentioned, I'm currently working on helping others, including chambers, to improve how they approach their business. But uh, my career has been involved with uh, both the uh, government contracting, private sector business, and uh, uh, most recently, before my current consulting work, I I spent uh, nearly a couple decades as a chamber executive director. So um, during that time, we spent a good bit of effort on how, what are innovative ways that we could go beyond the traditional approaches that uh, are often used by chambers and create value for our members and chambers. Oh, well, thanks, Kevin. Hey, can you tell us a, a little more now about the uh, your networking ideas and some of your thoughts on that subject? Okay. Well, first, I would like to, to, to provide a little context for the whole networking discussion and, and really everything else the Chamber does that, that really feeds into how, how I really look at networking. Uh, a basic question faced by Chamber executive directors every day is, what should my Chamber be doing that's important to our members, prospective members, and community? That's the, the lifeblood, and I, I spend every day of my Chamber uh, uh, gig, uh, thinking about that and what could we be doing. In my experience, though, it's not clear that all members value the same things. Some are very focused on a transactional relationship, like uh, uh, what's the chamber going to do for me today, and if I put a dollar value on it, is it worth my membership dues? Uh, they, they're really penciling out a calculation. Others see uh, their chamber membership in much bigger terms. You know, is the chamber a positive influence in seeking to help our community be its best? And is our better is our business community better off because the chamber exists? So they're thinking a little bit bigger picture. Uh, and yet others may just consider it a uh, a necessary credential or a seal of credibility for doing business in their community. Uh, I always took the philosophy that a chamber will be most successful if it it can address each of these major drivers simultaneously. So think about all of these at once. Um, At the same time, in my experience, there are three basic strategies for chambers to add value. And so the strategies we work day day out, one was through advocacy, 
One was through aiding members in their visibility and how can they be noticed, how can they better market themselves. And the third was through useful services, direct services the chamber would provide that could be of value to members. Most chambers have fairly limited resources for pursuing these strategies, so uh, they need to do it to get the best bang for the buck. And with, in order to do that, there are a few criteria I would suggest that are really important to apply uh, as you think about how you go about these strategies. First, is there a compelling argument for how a chamber activity or service will enhance the business environment or the community in general? Uh, in other words, will it help build the chamber's brand, uh, uh, how the chamber is seen as relevant in its community, and how much influence it has? Second uh, criteria is can a dollar value be placed on the benefit of an activity or service to the member who participates and uses it? And third, can an activity or service pay for itself and if uh, the best case even generate some net revenue? which could come in the form of non-dues revenue, uh, new members attraction, member retention uh, that exceed incremental costs. So today I want to talk specifically about the, how the chamber role in networking activities can play an important role in these strategies. Whether or not a chamber has any involvement, professional networking has always been and will continue to be a fundamental bread and butter business activity. Probably networking is as old as business itself. It's one of the primary ways that a business or organization can generate word of mouth and support in its support and to gather business intelligence, learn about new methods and ideas, identify leads for sales and hiring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think everyone's familiar with why networking is important. And these are certainly examples of the things that happen through networking. At my chamber, we had long offered business after hours and business breakfast events, which incorporated networking as uh, main uh, aspects of what those were about. Both of those regularly brought groups of people together for multiple purposes, including networking opportunities. But we noticed that they were only appealing to a sliver of our members. They tended to attract a constant core of, of the same 50 people, and that was less than 20% of our membership. Uh, they would also, uh, importantly, attract a high percentage of new members, so people who had just joined, this was a way they would get a feel for the chambers uh, participating in these events. Uh, and then also a sprinkling of people who were putting a toe in the water with respect to uh, were they interested in joining. Um, we got curious about whether we could engage more members and be more useful with respect to facilitating network opportunities. So we did a, some good uh, interviews, surveys, focus groups with our membership to try to see how they felt about this particular service. Uh, what we learned was that different people prefer different kinds of networking. And our study reached a number of uh, conclusions that were important to us that I think may be uh, relevant to others as well. Now, first, many people are uncomfortable with unstructured networking in large groups. We had a lot of people saying, I just, don't, I just feel awkward going into a large group and trying to strike up a conversation and have that conversation lead to anything that has to do with my business. Uh, that awkwardness meant that they were basically avoiding it, and, uh, and those kind of people rarely participated in our existing networking activities. Second conclusion, there was a desire for smaller gatherings that would enable and promote more in-depth interaction. So rather than a group of 50, pe uh, 50 people, 40 people, uh, people were interested in getting together with just a couple others. Um, there's also a desire to mix things up. Some people would say, gee, I come to the events and it's the same people all the time and I end up having the same conversation talking to the same people. So there's a desire to kind of mix up the, uh, the other people that, that they were interacting with when they were trying to do networking. And, and uh, a final conclusion I think is important in terms of how people are looking at doing networking these days. And, 
the use of networking sites, predominantly LinkedIn, has, has really increased in popularity and use. So with these conclusions, we set out to see what we could do with what we'd learned. And that led us to implementing an approach to organizing regular networking lunches for representatives from four to five member businesses. These were set up on a biweekly basis at uh, chamber member cafes and restaurants in the community. The chamber made the matches, uh, set up the appointments, and made the logistical arrangements like the uh, reservations at the restaurants. Uh, we made sure to mix up the memberships of the small groups to each time to ensure variety. So we were keeping track of who we're meeting this week, uh, who we're meeting uh, in the past week so that we didn't get, put the same group together over and over and over. We kept uh, a good mixture going to keep it fresh. And we worked to make the members' involvement as effortless as possible. We found if the member had to do a lot of work, and you can imagine the amount of work that goes into uh, even just setting up a lunch for five different uh, people who aren't typically talking to each other on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, that could be daunting if we weren't playing the role of helping that happen effortlessly. So from this program, uh, we ended up having more than 100 members opt in. And that's double the core participation in our traditional business after hours and business breakfast group that we continued to do as well. Certainly there was some crossover between them, but, we, but it, uh, it, it absolutely brought in probably three quarters of these people, people who weren't participating before in networking activities. We positioned this both as a visibility initiative and a member service in terms of our offering to our members. So how did this activity measure up to the criteria I mentioned earlier? Now, that first criteria again, is there a compelling argument for how it, advances, it enhances the business environment or the community in general? What we found is this was a highly visible activity that regularly engaged members who had not been participating. The member restaurants who were involved were very appreciative. They saw direct business uh, and other members that, that they maybe hadn't been seeing coming into their business, and they had an opportunity to show off, and it wasn't uncommon for them to grab a seat and join in uh, or with one of these small group interactions. And we were also able to insert chamber staff and board members into the groups um, in order to use th these networking luncheons as member outreach and relationship building activity. We were able to, for instance, gather opinions from people very real time about advocacy efforts and other things that we were doing. So there was a there was a whole range of, of uh, ways that that first criteria was met and the value was added. Uh, reminding you, the second criteria could the, the value be placed on the benefit to a member who participates and. What we the, the found through surveys of people who participated is they saw direct benefit that they could put a dollar value on in the form of new client development, referrals that they had uh, obtained, and establishing new relationships that really led to business development. And finally, did it pay for itself or even generate some net revenue? Um, the, 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 we found that the existence of the service became a direct benefit in member recruitment and retention. It was something we could point to that people uh, found very uh, interesting and compelling uh, as a benefit that they responded to well. Uh, a key enabler of the initiative was the use of a computer software service. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to manage the work involved without adding staff. So that played a very important role. Otherwise, we would have uh, uh, th this would have been all we've been doing if we hadn't had a good tool to put to use that really uh, allowed us to manage this program with e the existing staff resources we already had, uh, um, and it, without it becoming an undue burden. And, uh, and there is also uh, a non-dues revenue potential associated with that computer software service. So there's actually ways to generate some revenue from that. So in conclusion, uh, expanding our network offerings 
turned out to be a real useful innovation. And I would argue it deserves consideration by chambers every year. If you've uh, uh, been, uh, if your chamber's been looking at it and trying to understand how might we increase the value of our efforts to facilitate networking, um, the, the experience that that we've had in uh, in our chamber could be of use to you. Gee, Kevin, that sounds like a really good program. Uh, hey, if if someone was interested in learning a little more about that uh, networking program or had some other questions uh, for you, is there a good way that they might contact you? Yeah, I'd invite them to get in touch. Hopefully you can pr- post this uh, also on the uh, 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 the web link uh, or on your page. Uh, my uh, The Highline website is highlinenm.com. And my email is highlinenm at gmail.com. And people could also find me on uh, LinkedIn if you want to network there. But would would love to talk to anybody about our experience and whether it can be of, uh, of use to you and your chamber. All right, Kevin. Well, hey, I just want to thank you for taking some time to share all of this with us and let our listeners know uh, to stay tuned to catch our next program on Chamber Talk Radio. Until then, have a great day. Also, Kevin's tip of the week is coming up next. Okay, this is uh, Kevin Dwyer with Kevin Dwyer & Associates, and this is the tip of the week. Hi, this is Kevin Dwyer with Kevin Dwyer & Associates, and this is your tip of the week, the value of taking a position on issues. One of the most difficult decisions chambers of commerce, associations, and membership organizations have to make over time is whether to take a position on hot-button issues facing their communities. This is particularly challenging for organizations in smaller communities where everyone knows each other and business people are not only running their own businesses on a day-to-day basis, but may be involved in local politics, public schools, the arts, youth sports, and so on. While many organizations are reticent about taking positions, supporting political candidates, or advocating for business interests for fear of losing existing members or alienating potential new members, other organizations roll up their sleeves and dive right in. Look around you. Oftentimes, the most active, involved, passionate, dare I say, most successful chambers, associations, and membership groups are those that aren't afraid to jump into the fray and take a position on a controversial topic. For example, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce heavily advocates for and lobbies Congress, the Oval Office, and federal agencies on behalf of businesses large and small. Whether you agree with their stance on a particular issue or not, they are making their presence known and pushing an agenda that favors business first. Your chamber, association, or membership organization can do the same. What it requires is the formation of a governmental affairs committee dedicated to addressing issues that could impact your members. The committee can be made up of board members and members at large who are interested in becoming more involved. It can be a great way to engage your membership in a very meaningful endeavor. Like a lot of things, however, the devil is in the details when it comes to moving forward with an advocacy plan. The best way to get started is to pull together an ad hoc committee and begin identifying key issues in your community region, or state, then assign folks to champion these issues and lead them in attracting members to support their efforts. At a previous chamber when I was executive director, we were able to turn back a county ballot measure that would have banned the use of GMO products in the community. Passage of the controversial measure would have had disastrous impacts on university research, jobs, and the local economy. Thanks to a grassroots campaign by chamber members that included doorbelling area residents, writing letters to the editor, and showing up in force at local forums, the ballot measure was soundly defeated. Yes, you may lose some members by wading into advocacy waters, but if your position is well thought out and your game plan is carefully executed, you will show your members and the larger community that your organization has a backbone and is not afraid to stand up and be counted. After doing so, 
you may soon discover that non-members and others who have been watching from the sidelines respect your actions, appreciate your efforts, and want to sign up and participate in what you are doing. Don't be afraid to take a position. Thank you for listening to Chamber Talk Radio. Be sure to visit our sponsors who are Kevin Dwyer and Associates at www.kdwyerassociates.com and the Membership Sales System at www.membershipsalessystem.com. Thanks for clicking in.